Okay. Ready? Yep. Great. Um, very happy to have Andrea with Carl. You can talk about changing about the end of the Thank you very much for the introduction. Also, thank you for uh, giving me the chance to talk here. Maybe I should have erased this. Or, well, I'll take care of this later. Um, so yeah, today we'd like to present uh, a work which is part of a joint project with uh, Gianluca Basso from the uh, University of Torino in Italy and Alessandro Codenotti who is also um, in Münster uh, where I'm based now. And so this is a project which uh, develops in the context of topological dynamics, in particular, the study of groups of homeomorphisms of certain topological spaces, in particular, uh, piano continua. This is not exactly my field, but it's something that I've been start studying over the last uh, six months. And I will start from, um, I will give a context which is slightly different from our original motivation. Our original motivation was to investigate the universal minimal flow of the homomorphism group of the Menger curve. So, um, we will get there by the end, but uh, I will present the problem in a slightly different uh, uh, way. I lost my notes, okay. So I'll just start with some basic definitions so that we are all on the same page. So a piano continuum. Is a compact uh, house door connected locally connected metric space. And for those of you who are not familiar with this class of objects, uh, path is in parentheses because it's automatic, it's redundant. And so the context, the type of objects I will focus on for today are what I'm gonna call chains on piano continuum. And by chain, I mean, uh, something more. So I mean, maximal chains of close connected subsets of a piano continuum. So let's say a piano continuum X is a space, topological space like that, and a maximal chain, and implicitly I mean of closed connected uh, subsets. Of x in x is a subset of closed subsets of x. So by k of x, I mean the the Tori space. This is the set who, uh, whose point are all compact subsets of x, and we think of this as a compact metric space with the Hausdorff topology. So the Tori space with Hausdorff uh, Hausdorff metric. So a chain is a collection of closed sets such that every element in C is connected C is linearly ordered by inclusion And it is maximal, so precisely you can think of that if you take another compact subset of X, such that if you add K to C, you would get, again get something linearly ordered by inclusion, then K was already in C to begin with. then K is in C. Right, so let me draw a picture. So you can think of K of X as a space that looks like this. Here at the base, we have the smallest compact subsets of X. So the singletons on the top, we have X. So I'm already ordering it, let's say, uh, by inclusion. So a maximal chain, you should think of this as a path that starts from one of the points at the bottom and gets to the top. And it's something that you can prove. You can show it's, again, uh, close and connected in K of X. So in particular, a chain 
C, uh, well, let's notice two things. Uh, the first one is that it can be, when it's made of connected uh, elements, it can be parameterized as an arc in K of X. And by this, I mean that you can really think of this as a homeomorphic copy of the interval, closed interval zero one in K of X. And also this element is a closed subset of K. So we can think of it, of it as an element in Viatoris of Viatoris of X. Right, so let me draw another picture just to show you how, they look, how these objects look like on a topological space. So let's take X equal to uh, the sphere. So our chains will have some root, a starting point, and then they will look like something like this, increasingly larger and larger closed subsets of the space that will eventually cover the whole thing. Or another option is for instance, to take something like what I'm gonna call array, so a chain whose initial segments are always isomorphic to, uh, again, an arc, a copy of the interval zero one. If you have a curve that covers a dense subset of the sphere parameterized over infinity, then it will give you a chain. So let me just isolate this definition. A ray is a chain, see, such that every of its element is uh, homeomorphic to zero one, so it's an arc. Right. And again, this is maybe not, it's uh, not too hard to show. I'm gonna call the set of all maximal chains by capital T of X. And so this is a set that sits in these viatories of viatories of X and it is closed. So I wanna start with a very vague and general question concerning chains on piano continua. And the question is, for which spaces do we get essentially a unique chain? There is essentially a unique chain. Sorry? Exactly. So, of course, if I take a chain like this, say the arc, and I just move the point by a homeomorphism, I don't want to say that these chains are different. I want to think them as being the same chain. So, when I look at a homeomorphism of the piano continuum, this will induce, again, a homeomorphism of this space. It will induce a homeomorphism of this space, which will preserve all maximal chains. So, of course, I want to work up to homeomorphism. But also here you can see I have to, maybe I can use colors. So, it's so this would be, I, I draw two di distinct chains and one as sort of a more one dimensional nature compared to the other. So it's very hard to say that they should be the same. So of course I wanna allow some tolerance. So more precisely, um, when can we find um, a chain which has a Comiger orbit in here? such that when we apply every homeomorphism of X to C, we get a Comiger set in field of X. So this was the precise formalization of the question. And um, I will start right away with a theorem which was sort of the inspiration for our work, which is due to uh, Gutmann, Sankov, and Zucker from 2021. 
So, and they show that if X is a compact manifold of dimension at least three, then there is no commigger chain. Uh, 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 there is no chain with commigger orbit. There is no chain with commigger orbit. So I will say commigger orbit. And again, I always have in mind this action here, which is a continuous action with a commigger orbit. So in some sense, the result um, so, so as, as I was saying, the result, which was sort of the inspiration for, for our main result, which I will state in a second, um, their proof was uh, very geometrical and very much hands-on. It was very much based in R to the N. It was based on the working with uh, some notion of winding number. And basically what we did was to look at their proof and try to eliminate all the geometric component until we were left only with some uh, topological and combinatorial component. And this led us to the following results. Namely that you get the same conclusion if X is a piano continuum with no local separating points. Which I will define in a minute. And no open planar subsets. Open planar subsets, then again, there is no, um, there is no chain with Comigar or and there is no chain with the Comigar orbit. And so before I define these two properties, this is, well, doesn't require much definition. It means that every subset of X with non-empty interior cannot be embedded in the plane. Uh, let me quickly define this. So given a space X, a subset K of X is uh, non-locally separating. If removing K not only leaves X, so X, we want it to be, let's say, um, connected, but really the definition, I guess, makes sense more in general, is not if for every open subset of X, which is every subset of it, which is open and connected, then Removing K doesn't change the fact that U is connected, is still connected. So um, these are the two properties. And when applied to the world of manifolds, these two conditions exactly uh, correspond to having dimension at least three. But the space we had in mind, uh, so new example, is um, the Menger curve. And many more spaces which can be defined starting with this. All right. So as I said, these two conditions uh, together in the world of manifolds, they give you dimension at least three. If you only remove this, you end up with manifolds of dimension two. And if you also remove this, you end up with, I always talk about compact manifolds, uh, with manifolds of dimension one. And in fact, 
you can see that uh, the, the assumption that points are non-locally separating is necessary for this result. So non-local separating points is necessary. And the example you can think of are one-dimensional compact manifolds. Well, manifold And you can also think with boundary here. So if you look at x equals the circle, or even x equals the interval, then given a point, you can look at the chain which grows on both sides of the point uh, in the same way. So you, you can, of course, for instance, define a chain that only grows in this direction or in the other direction, or maybe it does a little bit of both. But if you look at the chain that grows uniformly on both sides, then you can see that the orbit is the set of all maximal chains such that if two subsets of the chain have a, a extreme point in common, then the two sets are the same. And you can show that that's a G delta. And you get similarly chain here. You fix. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that fall off or in that as a bridge of the rosin and more long? That's also, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think you said the computer for S1. Yeah, yeah. So for S1, the universal, well, homeomorphism that preserves the orientation is S1. Here it's even extremely amenable. So, yes. Yeah. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, Menger curve is a subset of the plane. How can. No, Menger curve, you define it in the space. Oh, no, this is a two dimensional Menger compact. Menger curve is one dimensional. So, uh, by Menger curve, I mean the unique up to home. It's not a manifold. Uh, up to homeomorphism, one dimensional uh, piano continuum with no open planar. Well, basically, that satisfies this condition. It's the unique one dimensional piano continuum with these two conditions with no uh, open planar subsets. So it doesn't embed in R2. And with no local separating points. Precisely. So um, I will make the drawing probably again later. So you have your cube, and you start iter iteratively removing, carving these central tunnels. And then you repeat this for all. Uh, the other cubes, so I will just draw two of them. But yeah, it's non uh, it's non planar set, so you cannot embed it into the plane. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. In fact, yeah. Okay, I guess. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, wait. What did you say? You have something three dimensional. You touch a line. Yeah, yeah. But would you get a Comigar orbit of just because of that line? Oh, okay, okay, yes, yes, fine. You have one uh, separating point, but not everywhere. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, this is a bit sloppy, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, let's say globally you need uh, this problem. So the last thing I wanna add before uh, discussing the proof of this is that in dimension two, uh, the problem is open, is open. The problem as of now is open. Um, in particular, you can think of this very concrete question. So what about the sphere? Um, is there um, a Comigar orbit for the action of the homeomorphisms of the sphere onto its uh, maximal chains? Is the problem. Okay. Ah, this doesn't move. In a particular action for a particular group. Yes. 
No, for now, no. Of course, like, yeah, I guess you already know where I'm going with this, but um, having the universal minimal flow in mind, by, by, I mean, the literature shows that often we end up looking at these spaces anyway. But here I'm working in a slightly more general context. Like, I, as of now, I don't care even if this action is minimal. So it might be not minimal. Um, all right. Okay, so let's discuss the proof of this. So I assume the talk is one hour and a half. Like, okay, good. For a second, I thought maybe it changed and then I panicked for a second for a moment. Well, no, I would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. I'll try my best not to make you miss the coffee. Right. So, um, usually, customarily, how do we check that an action, especially on a space like this, which is quite complicated, has Kumiger orbits? So, this often goes back to uh, crit criterion due to Rosendahl, but really the direction we care about is a consequence of uh, uh, Efros theorem. So, imagine you have an action of a Polish group G on a Polish space Y, which is continuous action. And suppose it has uh, a Kumiger orbit. And so by the Efros theorem, you can show that this action, so this action is, let's say Y has no isolated point as a dense orbit. So in particular, it's topologically transitive, but a Kumiger orbit actually gives you more. Uh, what you can show is that by Efros theorem, you have a property which I don't know if it has a name. I will call, let's say, small local topological transitivity. And by this, I mean that for every open subset of the group, which I will just... Uh, uh, denote by epsilon, and this corresponds to the set G epsilon of all elements in the epsilon ball of the uh, identity of the group. So what is this small local transitivity? We get local transitivity for these open subsets, open neighborhoods of the identity. So for every open neighborhood of the identity of the group, for every open subset uh, of the space, we can find another open set where I'll say um, there is, yeah, there is a partial dense orbit. There is a G epsilon dense orbit, or what I prefer to say is whenever you take two open subsets of V, then G epsilon can move one of them in an adjacent way to the other. So again, Kumiger orbit implies topological transitivity, but it also implies this local transitivity for open neighborhoods of the And this is the criterion we want to falsify to verify that there is no Kumiger orbit in our setting. We will want to find a way to um, show that this small local transitivity fails for the action of homomorphisms of X onto uh, maximal chains. And what will happen is essentially that um, the failure of this condition will correspond to, in some way, a failure of a certain weak amalgamation property for a certain extension of uh, the family of finite graphs. Uh, with monotone surjective maps. So the first thing to do now, before uh, getting to falsifying that, is get a handle of the topology of this. So as I said, this lives in Vietoris of Vietoris of X, and this is not a nice topology to describe. It's not a nice, of course you have a metric, but it's sort of Hausdorff of Hausdorff metric. So it gets a bit nasty. So um, the first thing to do is to find some nice open subsets, possibly a pi base, of this space so that we can restrict to certain nice open subsets. 
And these open subsets will come from essentially discretizing the space and discretizing what chains do on the space. So I will introduce a couple more definitions. Um, a partition, which is not really a partition, technically I should call it a quasi partition, but I will only deal with these type of objects. So I will call them partitions of X, X always piano continuum is a covering, a finite covering of X. Uh, let's call it uh, U. Uh, such that all elements of the covering are closed regular sets. with connected interior and I should also say well parwise this joint interior so okay I'll just state it like this distinct then they have this joint interior so this is very um natural of course if you have a zero, a zero dimensional space this is just a partition in clopen sets uh, otherwise when your space is like this i'm thinking of partitions like this where they are allowed to overlap on the boundary but essentially up to some error they are a partition in the space and the theorem that it's fundamental, I, I will not say exactly, I mean, I will use it all the time, sort of implicitly is due to Bing. I think it's from the 40s or 50s. There were different versions of this, is that when you have a piano continuum, you can find especially nice partitions like this that are finer and finer and they refine each other. So the mesh, the diameter of the components gets smaller and smaller. So you can basically find this discretization of the space that describe X better and better. So uh, for a piano continuum X, there exists a uh, decreasing sequence of what I'm going to call brick partitions. So you have a sequence of partitions indexed over N such that, um, so what I mean by decreasing sequence of brick partition, I mean that UI plus one refines UI. This is what a decreasing sequence is. And brick partition, I don't want to give the exact definition. Well, it's not too hard. The pieces are assumed to be uniformly locally connected, but the pieces are nice. Oh. Partition and their union, their finite unions are nice in some suitable sense. So, really, you should think of something like this that looks like a brick wall. Okay. So since we want to describe open subsets of the chain space, um, we add a little bit to these partitions that will describe, basically, the open sets we want to look at are those sets of chains that follow a certain path along a given partition. So um, another definition, as I said, I need a couple definitions here. So bear with me for a while. Um, a walk on a partition, uh, let's say I walk W, let's say it's, yeah, made of a, well, I walk W on a partition V is a finite sequence uh, yeah, W zero, W and minus one of elements of the partition. Um, which are part ways adjacent. Um, so such that 
UI intersection UI plus one is not empty. And this is a very general definition. What, what I want really to work with are simple walk. So let's say a simple walk is a walk such that WI intersection with WJ is non empty if and only, sorry, this in my head, is non empty if and only if the two indices have a dist are distance at most y. So let's, let's make a drawing just to clarify what I'm doing here. You have a given partition, which usually is going to be nice as those that Bing's theorem give us. And so a walk is just a selection of pieces. Yeah, it's a it's on a if you want. Yeah, right. So when you have a partition, you you, you can really think of it as a as a graph where the pieces of the partition correspond to vertices and edges are correspond to adjacent relations. So this is a linear order on a subgraph. We don't want to exhaust the space, not necessarily, but yeah. So for instance, uh, you can also like, if you don't assume simplicity, this would be a simple walk. If you don't assume simplicity, you can also think of going back. So this definition doesn't quite correspond to order, but this. Um, and so finally, the relevant bit that tells us that simple walk, I mean, this is important definition, although the details will be hidden a little bit, a walk, W on a partition V refines uh, a walk W prime on another partition V prime if, well, the partition refine each other, if V refines V prime. And so here you have some degree of flex flexibility on how to define this notion of refinement. I will give the strongest definition. Um, it's not going to be. Um, it's not going to make any difference in hindsight in our setting. So and so V refines V prime, and there exists. Okay, so I need to give some names. So let's say W is W zero, W n minus one, and V W prime is uh, U zero, U m minus one. So the two walks don't need to have the same length, but we can find k smaller than n. So initial segment of the Finer walk and a surjection f that goes from k to m, such that we don't want this map to jump too much. So such that f of j minus f of j plus one is always smaller than or equal than one. So this map sort of always moves at most by one and W of J, so the element in here corresponding to a given index is contained in U of FJ. So let's maybe give an example here. So say you start from this is the partition B prime and this is the walk W prime. You have U0, U1, U2, and U3. And then you consider a finer partition. Oh, this this and then w prime can be anything like w zero it can double a certain set then go here and maybe here and then it can continue that's why we take k to be smaller than that all right so with this setting we can finally look define the open sets in phi of x we care about so given a walk V, sorry, W on a partition V, we define the open set in P of X defined as like this. So we call it O of W V. And this is the set of all chains so basically what I want to say, imagine, let's look at the white path. I want to look at all chains that start in U0, and then as they extend, they first go in U1, then they go in U2, and then they go in U3. I want to look at the open set of all chains that follow the walk I have given. Okay. 
So the refining walk n will be at least m, yes. But yeah, it, it can go, it can be it can be much larger. Well, k can be equal to n minus one. Oh yeah, okay, yes. Sorry. I guess uh So yeah, the proper way to write this down would be something like for every, so let's say W again is, is W zero, WN minus one. So for every of these elements in the walk, we can find an element of the chain, which intersects uh, all the pieces before I. So K intersection WJ is non-empty for every j smaller equal than y, and k is contained in the union of the interior wj. So, blue, why not? So let's uh, erase the red part. So given this walk, a nice chain that will be in the open set defined by this would be something that starts here, then maybe it gets bigger, then maybe it gets here, then maybe it gets here, and maybe it continues with the path. And really, a uh, simple walk are those open neighborhood you get from arrays. Like if you have array, it's very easy to define a simple walk from there because it's very easy to avoid to touch yourself after uh, well, as you move around. So, sort of easy observation. If W on V, if a walk on a partition V refines W prime on V prime, then of course the open set will satisfy a containment relation. So taking a finer walk just forces more information on what the chain has to do. This little f takes an initial segment here and maps it surjectively on the whole less fine. Yeah, because I want to allow the walk maybe to go further after and do other things after that. Well, which means that you, you care about the beginnings. Yeah. 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 The beginning is what gives you the open set. And I mean, you can, I guess, define refinement. All, you can make the definition in many ways, but. Uh... All right. Okay. So now. Yeah. So just one technical proposition um, that will be needed to finally get to that criterion there. So all I'm doing now is just make my life easier to look at the at this. You can see this, this, this criterion has many quantifiers and many open sets. And the problem with this P of X space is that the topology is terrible. Like it's, it's, a, it's sort of convoluted definition. So all this work I'm doing of discretizing things is just to make my life easier uh, when I want to look at that. So the proposition, sort of technical, but I hope um, not too much. So as always, let X be a piano continuum. So here I'm going to be very uh, lazy and just assume all the assumptions we have there. Something like this probably can be done with less, but so with no local separating points and no open planar subsets. Subsets. Um, take a simple walk. Uh, 
on a certain partition and let u be some open subset on this uh, open set given by the simple walk, then uh, there is a simple walk W prime on some refinement of V V prime refining V uh, W sorry refining W such that all W prime V prime is contained in U. So in particular, um, the family of all these open sets where W is a simple walk. is what's usually called the pi base. Meaning, so parentheses in the parentheses, for every open set W, there is one of these guys inside W. The point I want to make is that when I look at that criterion, I can always basically assume to look at open sets of this form, and I can always assume one they're refining each other, and this will be important uh, later. So I can maybe, I think I'm going very fast, so I can maybe uh, give a sketch in a specific case. So at least they can show you why these properties are at least uh, relevant here. Here, they, they help, again, without you could do, uh, something they're going to be fundamental later when we falsify that so sketch but in a special case so let's assume uh, the first open set we're given is just the whole space so I want to show you that walks show that walks uh, can be refined by simple walks So this would be the case where the first set is the whole thing. I should probably call this Y. And U is just O W prime V prime where W prime is not simple. And so what's the situation? We have our space here. We have some partition V. And we have a walk W, which is not simple. So let's say W0, W1, W2. You see W2 now touches W0, so this is not simple anymore. And maybe you also go back. So you go like this. And the crucial property that we need, and it's a consequence of this guy, and this guy is the so-called disjoint arc property. So let's call this one and let's call this two. So piano continua which satisfy one and two have the so-called disjoint arc So in my abstract, I use the another term, which is cross-connectedness, which I realized then was always used in the paper I was very much uh, focusing on. So probably that's not much, um, that's not known as terminology, but I think this is a bit uh, better. So the disjoint arc property meaning that um, if I1, I2, let's say, our arcs. So I have two homeomorphic, I have two paths in Y joining uh, uh, two pairs of points. Then, and, uh, and I am given a positive epsilon, then I can find I1 prime, I2 prime, such that now they are disjoint. And the extreme points 
I will just write this. I hope it's clear. Are the same. So maybe I'll make another drawing just here, what I mean. Is that when you have these non-local separating points and no open planar subset, you can give me any two pairs of points and maybe I have two arcs that connect them and I can, if you give me epsilon, I can change them a little bit. And now they're destroyed. Maybe they're gonna be changed over here, but the extremes are the same. And so you see, the Menger curve, for instance, is one dimensional, but to me, this is a very three dimensional type of behavior. And it's why in dimension two, this whole proof sorts of uh, breaks down. So how do you get from this walk a simple walk? Well, you just select a bunch of points. You start from W zero, then you pick one in the first frontier, then a second one in another frontier, then you go up, then W three and W four, you go up here, and then you maybe you finish here. And basically, you use path connectedness to join them. But maybe when you join them the first time, you don't do a great job. Maybe you mess things a little bit up. You do something like this, and you end up with a, something which is not an arc because it crosses itself. But now you use the this, this joint arc property, and you can use it on each single block. And what you're going to do here is simply make them disjoint. And to find your walk, as I said, simple walks, uh, you should think them as open neighborhoods of rays, um, you're just gonna, you just wanna find a sort of fine enough partition um, that follows the walk. And uh, and that will be your, so here the, the drawing, okay, I will not draw the next part because the blackboard is not three dimensional, but I guess you get the picture. In fact, what you can show here, I will just put in parentheses, when uh, Y is a piano continuum with those properties, you can show that rays, in fact, uh, rays, so these maximal chains, which look like arc that get longer and longer, are dense in few lengths. All right. Um, what? Okay. Sorry? I I haven't thought about it. I don't know. So to make my life slightly easier, now I will focus on the Menger curve. And by making my life easier, I simply mean that the imprecise um, um, things I'm gonna say, they will be a bit closer to what's actually happening. So I will say a bit less lies. So let me draw a nice big Menger curve now. Oh yeah, no, before doing this, I need something else, sorry. Which is the whole key object that makes this uh, criterion fail. And in fact, this is the, this idea is uh, due to um, Gutmann, Sankov and Zucker. And we are, we just basically uh, made it very combinatorial and translated to something about uh, graphs. So the, what, what would be the rough idea? Again, you wanna show a failure of this small local topological transitivity and in three-dimensional manifolds, what Gutmann, Sankov, and Zucker did was basically showing that, okay, you start from uh, some open neighborhood of the, the identity on the group, you choose some open set, the first part is not really relevant, then you're given some upper, some other open subset. So you can think of you're given some partition with a walk, and this corresponds in some sense to array in your space. And now they use the notion of winding number to define two chains, one turning clockwise many times, the other one turning anti-clockwise counterclockwise many times. And these two rays will give you W0 and W1. And this winding number being very different will make it impossible for G epsilon when the number of rounds is big enough compared to epsilon to move one to the other. So let's try to make this a bit more precise. 
So given a cycle, so here the definition is in the world of graphs with R being the uh, edge relation, uh, fix some, I would say orientation of the cycle, but I just, I mean something that tells me what's clockwise and what's not. It's what counterclockwise. So really an orientation which goes like this. And so the winding number of a given walk on the, on the cycle. So I'm using the same terminology I used for partition, but this is because I'm thinking really partitions as graphs. So if I walk W, W0, WN minus one on C. So here to be just precise, I mean that all WIs are vertices and they are the adjacent to each other. Uh, the successors are always adjacent. So the winding number is defined as uh, is so it's something you can define basically inductively. Uh, this walk is of length n, and let's look at this function beta, and beta does what you expect. So beta of two adjacent vertices will be equal to zero if the vertices are equal. It will be equal to one. If the couple x, y, I would say is well oriented meaning that it follows the orientation we fixed here and we give it minus one if instead y, x is well oriented. And this will be sort of the uh, quantity that will make that we we will use to make this um, uh, criterion thing. Right. So I'll go back to my drawing here. Let me just this is my Menger curve. And when I want to do this, is first consider a partition that will play the role of the cycle there. So uh, let me can do something like this. I, I really need just not too many pieces. Let's do something like this. And then it goes back there. So let's look at that partition and it can use as a graph. So the graph would be something like uh, one point, 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 and then So let me maybe write some names. This is U0, U1, oh, uh, to give you, I should have probably, maybe I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I save myself some trouble. So as I said before, I really think partitions as uh, graphs. So if this is piece V0, this piece we call V1, and this piece we call V2, uh, the graph I was drawing there, I will just draw it here, will correspond to something like this. So this would correspond to the piece V0, uh, V1, and V2. Okay. So we have all the pieces. So what do we want? We want to have that criterion fail. And what's the negation? Well, we want to find somewhere where this small local topological transitivity fails. So we want to find some open neighborhood of the identity in the group. We want to find some open subset of P of X such that no matter where I look inside you,
I can find two of these open sets. So these are all open, such that this intersection is empty. So who do I choose? So we fixed this partition of the Menger curve. We have this cycle. So we take, so here is uh, the first part. We take epsilon small enough so that it doesn't break too much, this, this partition. In particular, so that when we apply uh yeah g epsilon of vi so one of these pieces it will be contained only in the adjacent ones we don't want to move it too much so i will write something that maybe doesn't make too much sense but i hope you get the point so here maybe you want to put some modulo one two three how, how do you choose this initial package? this is the one that you yeah have. this is the one here this is the minimal one that, that is also how uh you need five pieces but i yeah, the thing is, when you define the winding number, I didn't say it there, but you want to sort of fix a uh, starting point. When you compare two walks, you want to have a starting point. So for me, the starting point would be this block. So I want to make sure that when I apply G, the starting point is the same thing. So that's why I'm putting these other two bands. Technically, you can also take just four points if you want. So yeah, I'm hiding a little bit of details, but with enough pieces, it, it will be fine. And you, so you again, it's an open subset of this. So it's like, where do we want our chain to start? Remember, U can be something of the form O, W, V, something of this form here. And we just want to say, let's start the chain here. So U says, start the chain. Well, I can really tell you explicitly what it is. U is just O of wv where v is that partition and w is simply the singleton e zero so we want the, the chain to start here then we have some adversary that gives us an open subset uh, of u and now we use this proposition here it gives us something but we can always assume it's a refinement of a simple walk of course w here it's a simple walk because it's a simple it's, it's a unique piece so I'll write it in parentheses here. This is, uh, you will see the graph will look like a form of weak amalgamation. Amalgamation, amalgamation going on here. So basically a refinement of V and a refinement of W, which I will represent as something like this. So here you're going to have a bunch of vertices, which are the vertices which are mapped here. Here you put all the vertices which are mapped in V2. Here the one that are mapped here. So I'm just drawing this graph so that it looks like a projection. And it's going to give us a walk. So it starts from here, 0, and then maybe it goes here, 1, maybe it goes here, 2, and we can stop there. So this is the walk. So who are these two guys going to be? So well, let's make a star. So this was the dot. Right, so let me make another drawing now. So we look, let's look at the, at the, Menger, curve, uh, the Menger curve from above. But it looks like this. Like a Serpinski carpet, if you want. And the partition we gave, maybe we call this V0, was originally this. And this set V, which corresponds here to a certain path, uh, is a walk. But really, you can, what you should have in mind is that. The adversary here, the other player, if you think of this thing as a game, gave us array, gave us something 
that starts from here and it goes in these blocks. One, two, three. Well, zero, one, two. Of course, you should think of a small tube around it, but let's just draw it as a ring. And so now what do you do? You use again this, this joint arc property to extend this ray so that it doesn't intersect itself. So the whole arc property, all these topological properties are all done to make sure that you don't self-intersect. And we extend it in two ways. The first one will just go round and round the Menger curve. So go, this is clockwise, yeah. clockwise. Uh, until uh, the winding number is big enough. Now here, what do we mean by winding number? When I have a walk on this, of course, it projects onto a walk on this cycle, so I can just use the definition of winding. And again, this idea, I uh, want to stress it again, it's really just uh, inspired to, it, it appears also in the work by Gutmann, uh, Sankov and Zucker. And the other walk, maybe I use a different color. Uh, no, never mind. Just starts from here and goes in the opposite direction. So it goes counterclockwise. But you see, I can always avoid anything that I've already done. I can always dodge or modify things because of this disjoint. So yellow goes. counterclockwise um, enough. And so at the level of this picture here, so if I want to see what the square was, no, sorry, the star, well, uh, what are these W0 and W1? Well, I can think of, now I can like sort of dilate this thing. I can think of a sort of power here. So these are all the, here. You're going to have a bunch of vertices which are eventually mapped here. You're going to have a bunch of vertices which are mapped there and so on and so forth. Oh, this is a terrible point. So basically, this would be, let's say, W0. And it's an open set given by a partition. So this, these vertices represent the partition. So I'm really refining that thing there, which in the walk would initially follow whatever this was. And then it will basically start turning clockwise. So let's also do this. Then maybe it goes up. Uh, no. And we can assume it's a simple walk by, by going. Basically, the idea is that you want to go high enough. OK, I'm losing track of my drawing, but you get the point. And on the bottom side, you have similar thing, except you go in the opposite direction. So I'm just. So you first follow whatever the red part was, and then you go counterclockwise. Now, here an important remark, um, which I can make perhaps here. The graphs there correspond quite well to partitions and the colored lines correspond to walks. So the arrows in that diagram, the arrows in that diagram, they correspond to the refinement of walks. But really at the level of graphs, they are uh, surjective, monotone, graph, homomorphisms.
where monotone means that the preimage of a vertex is connected. And this is a result due to Suavec and Aristoteles. Panagiotopoulos, uh, Greek in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Solesky, I know how to write. Oh, he also can help. Yeah, I think I think I might have missed maybe one you, but anyway. So they show that um, if you only look at graphs with these maps, you have amalgamation. You have amalgamation for graphs, connected graphs with such maps. And in fact, the um, Fresnel limit you get from there is precisely the Menger curve. What we're saying here is that if we extend the language, if you put a linear order on the graph, here I'm just looking at the initial segment of the linear order, this amalgamation will fail. And so if you think of the Menger cur curve as like the generic uh, limit of this, there is no generic limit there, which is exactly saying there is no commingle orbit for this uh, action. So this amalgamation fails. fails if you expand. I will be very vague here. I will just say we expand the language with a linear order. Because, I mean, if this intersection was non-empty, it's, it's still an open set. So you can find again by that lemma, a walk refining everything. So it means that you can find something here, a graph gamma with a walk uh, W bar that refines both these things. Now, one refinement, this is W1. It's just, again, the usual identity. Here, it's a bit, okay, I should probably write a line like this because this will be an element of the group doing this. And there is no reason to believe that the element of the group behaves well with all this picture. But in the Menger curve, you can basically assume because of a bunch of properties about the automorphisms of the free space that G lands in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. The thing is, um, which is also a problem, like we have. Yeah, there are many ways to describe this. So it's not, again, we only care about the initial segment of whatever this structure does. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's go. On, uh, on. Yeah. Then you mentioned the beginning the automatic factor, but really you are looking just for logic, right? Just yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, uh, once you are doing this, uh, you look at the case of all compact sets, but this is uh, this was the case of all connected sets on the other side. No, wait, we are only looking at connected uh, no, chains. No, yeah, but the super space. Oh, um, space of all compact sets. that's right, space. yes. Um, I'm just saying it, then you just stick your thumb to a thumb on the space and then put the result in the same. This has to do with then wanting to find minimal actions. So it would make sense to restrict anyway, but yeah, I'm not sure. I, we always just thought in terms of this. Um, so you're saying, okay, you maybe have a larger space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, 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 that would be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, as I said, the restriction comes for uh, later. Oh, now it's late, huh? So yeah, I'll just write down the lemma that sort of uh, says in a precise way what I was uh, saying now. The lemma has two parts. And the first one is, uh, so if you have two simple walks, um, uh, 
which you can think of as a walk coming from a partition and then applied to the cycle there, refining uh, W prime, another simple walk. Then the winding number, like these arrows, these refinement arrows preserve the winding number. So uh, let's say the refinement happens via this surjection K to M, where K is uh, this subset, uh, smaller number than N. Then the winding number of W restricted to the J, the initial segment J, is the same as looking at the winding number here just stopping at fj. And so let's go back again one second. Why you cannot amalgamate here? If you could amalgamate, you would go here and then the walk here in its initial segment will have, will assume very low values of winding numbers because this becomes negative and in absolute value very big. So on the one hand side, it will need to assume a lot of, uh, it will need to become very large in absolute value, but in the negative part of the integers. And going here, if you ignore for a second G, it's doing the opposite. We'll need to assume large and larger values before being able to become small. And these two things contradict each other. So if you could amalgamate this property in the land of the winding number fails, but you have to keep track of G. And now we use this. Remember, we picked G so that it didn't shake too much this partition. And in fact, um, I will just say that acting. So if you look at the winding number, of G applied to a walk and you compare it with the walk itself, this will not change too much. It will just be at most one. And the idea is that G is changing the cycle by one at most. And so the winding number will not change. So just uh, two remarks. This proof essentially works the same on general piano continuum with like with no local separating points and no open planner set. The two main differences are that now the winding number, here the winding number was basically defined everywhere. The cycle corresponded to a actual partition of the space. In a general piano continuum, you might find a portion of the space where you have the winding number. So you have to be a bit more careful. And the second bit, which is a bit more annoying, is that now you cannot assume anymore that G exactly behaves like a refinement. This map G will become a multifunction, basically mapping vertices here to edges here to clicks because you have to think of that you have a partition and this map gg now will map it to something that maybe sits in a very diagonal way in the one you fixed but modulus and formalism is the same all right so now i can come to the motivation of why we looked at that um, which is the study of universal minimal flows So from this point of view, the goal, so motivation, uh, study this group, formula X, where X is this uh, Menger curve, or um, more generally a piano continuum with no local separating points. and no open planar subsets. And this fits in a much larger uh, line of research investigating non-locally compact groups. So um, especially in dynamic topology and descriptive set theory, non-locally compact groups tend to be quite hard to approach. So the way you study them is by looking at how they act on minimal uh, on systems. And so you restrict in particular to minimal dynamical systems. And information from there gives information about the space. In particular, um, people have been interested a lot uh, um, in the universal minimal flow of a non-locally compact group G. Uh, we are interested, let's say G equal to interested in the universal minimal flow MG which is uh, the unique minimal 
G uh, dynamical system, um, which subject which um, well of which all other minimal systems are factors. All other minimal G systems are factors. So, as I said. This is just for those of you who are maybe not familiar with this field. You want to study this group. It's not locally compact. So many of you might be used to work only with discrete groups. So customarily, you want to look at the dynamics of this group. So dynamical systems. Understanding dynamical systems, well, the minimal ones are the most fundamental. So you focus on those. And among these, there is one which is describing them all, if you want. And this it is this universal. Uh, minimal flow. So understanding the properties of the universal minimal flow gives you nice information about the group itself. And the corollary we get, so here, of course, I'm thinking about situations where the action is minimal. And in general, the action I looked at so far, which is these homeomorphisms of X acting on this, is not minimal, but, um, well, I want to phrase it maybe differently. Let's say the action uh, is minimal if, for instance, uh, the space X is, I would say, homogeneous enough. And this is a result of Gutmann that says that if the action of homeo X on X itself is locally transitive. Uh, which I don't want to really define. It means that on a given open subset, you get transitivity while keeping whatever outside the open set fixed, more or less. Then the action here is minimal. The action we were interested in since the beginning And so we can say interesting things in this framework. And the example, of course, we have in mind that it's always there, is the Menger curve. So the, in the Menger curve, um, this is true. Um, probably, I mean, this was maybe, I mean, this was not hard to prove with, with what the literature had. So the corollary we get from uh, the main result I discussed today is um, yeah that uh, let's state it in general. So if X is a piano continuum with uh, no local separating points and no open planar subsets. Um, such that this action is minimal. So in particular, uh, you can use the result of Gutmann there to find situation where this is true. Then Homeo X doesn't satisfy the so-called generic point property. Doesn't have the generic point property. So in particular, it's UMF is not a trifle. It's not a trifle in particular. Is not metrizable. So the picture you have here, again, this is, I guess, mainly for um, those in the audience who are not familiar with this. This is um, the study of universal minimal flows of non locally compact groups. And really, I think of mainly groups of automorphisms of countable or separable structures or groups of homeomorphisms of uh, compact metrizable spaces is something that really took off uh, thanks to the work of Slevo with Kekris and uh, Pestov 
in uh, linking the notion of extreme amenability to uh, some Ramsey property. And then now these techniques are quite far from there, but essentially you have a sort of degree of complexity of a group, which reflects how complicated the universal minimal flow is. So you have on the simplest, uh, the easiest part of the spectrum, you have extreme amenability, which means that the universal minimum flow is just a point. So these are all the groups uh, which whose minimal systems are always trivial. In particular, whenever you have an action on a compact metrizable space, you will always have a fixed point. Amenability tells you you always have a fixed point when the action is affine. Extreme amenability tells you even more. So the, in some sense, the dimension of the universal minimum flow reflects the complexity of the group. So the second layer of complexity is metrizable UMF. So here you have groups such that all uh, minimal systems are metrizable. And then in this chunk, the non-metrizable chunk is where like the most complicated and up to this day untractable spaces are. We have this generic point property, which exactly means that the universal minimal flow has a Comiger orbit. Which one way to interpret this is saying that the, the action on the UMF is transitive when you look at things with the classes of their uh, of their up to their equivalent, the, yeah, to their equivalence is transitive. And finally, so in particular, the homeomorphism of the Menger curve lands in here. And at the opposite side of the spectrum, all the way from extreme amenability, you have, uh, funnily enough, all discrete groups and all locally compact groups. So really this degree of complexity doesn't doesn't work in that setting. Uh, you can call them, they don't really have a name. I will just call them free acting. I think they don't have a name. I am sort of new to this field, but which means that there exists a free minimal uh, dynamical system. And these properties, which I wrote here only involve the universal minimal flow, but they reflect uh, to other uh, properties of the groups. In particular, well, the group here is extremely amenable. It's very nice. Metriz uh, groups whose UMF is metrizable have very large, extremely amenable subgroups. This is a result of, uh, I think, Meleret Sankov and Van der Nuy. Uh, Zucker showed that having a degeneric point property means that you have large, not very large, but just large, extremely amenable subgroups, whatever that means all the way to here where you cannot have extremely amenable subgroups because extremely amenable subgroups always fix points. So having a free minimal system prevents that. And you can say more, for instance, in this part, uh, the isomorphism relation between minimal dynamical system is smooth. So all this to say that these homeomorphism group, Menger curve, three-dimensional manifolds are very much uh, in the less, least understood part of the spectrum as of now. So in the last couple of minutes, I can almost finish um, early. I just want to make a remark about what happens in dimension two. And this is like in terms of manifolds, if you look at topologically, it simply means just assume um, non-local separating points without assuming the condition on the fact that the set has to be non-planar. Uh, so I, I told you that in terms of Comiger orbits, not much is known, but the methods by uh, Gutmann Sankov and Zucker show that uh, that this group potentially could have the generic point property. We don't know, but um, has non-metrizable universal minimal flow. So if X is a compact manifold, dimensional manifold so we know that they land in here 
And we are quite optimistic that a lot of their techniques, again, by drawing the geometric part, by, by taking out all the geometry in their proof, can be applied to that. And the this is all with a grain of salt because we need to verify two things. But what we think you can show is that also uh, the universal minimal flow of the Sierpinski carpet, I don't know what's the usual letter, I guess an S, uh, is not metrizable. And I will say just probably. Um, and so you, you, you are not doing this. You are going to you are intend to prove this by uh, analyzing the record uh, mm -hmm. No, they have a weaker criterion that uh, which, I. Which avoids the, the yeah, yeah. It basically says that in the beginning they all again look at the space of chains. By the way, one clarification, maybe for some of you is clear. Uh, of course, we are studying this space, but like this is not going to be the uh, universal minimal flow. We're just, we know that certain properties carry back to there. That's how we can reduce ourselves to study this. This is metrized. So given this clarification, they verify a, a weaker condition. Basically, again, in the space of chain, they say that they can find countably many open sets such that when you move them by an open neighborhood of the identity, they keep being disjoint. Uh, disjoint and this um again i don't know the details of why but entails that the umf is not metrizable but it says nothing on having a kumiger orbit so yeah potentially it could be um uh, i probably i mean we have some ideas but i will not say anything more and so i will stop here thank you very much for your attention